Hello everyone, how are you doing today? I'm feeling absolutely fabulous, as usual. Quite amazing, in fact. And I wanted to do a video response to a comment left by a commenter named Jennifer Moore that you see screenshotted here. Because I feel this comment actually reflects the view of many different Ethelists who have commented on my channel and interacted with me. It's um, So I think she speaks for a lot of other people when she says this comment. So thank you for being honest with your comment and letting me know what you think about this and for commenting on my other video um, and saying what you think about that as well. But I really want people to understand a few key things that I feel are extremely important. Number one, yes, I feel in various presentations, I have gone overboard in terms of my degree of intensity or aggression in opposition to Ethelist ideas. Um, but that in emotionality and intensity is very much so driven by really intense feelings I have thinking about a scenario where what if we actually had Ethelists in possession of a weapon that was like Death Star level or like a nuke that's incredibly powerful and they're the one in possession or accessing the thing or having access to it rather, you know? And I think about these scenarios and I'm like, holy shit. And that scenario, that's where my, that's where my intensity and my emotionality is coming from that. And on the other side of it, um, the fact that Ethelism, if it's not being actively engaged in either that way or via mass sterilization, somebody having the ability to force sterilize humans and all other species somehow outside of those two practical situations where something is doable with it, right? in terms of making something happen with it, it's just literally just armchair musing. So personally, as you know me quite well, if you've watched my channel, I have a big pet peeve with armchair philosophies, okay? Just musings of things that don't actually amount to anything or that are not practically doable in a day-to-day -day sense, in a tap-on-the-table-on-the-ground sense here and now. I'm, it doesn't matter what the philosophy is that's just armchair in nature. I despise armchair musings if they're not applicable to day to day. Okay. What are we, what are we able to do actively with this philosophy every single day? What are we going to be doing with it? It is a personal big pet peeve of mine. And yes, I probably could be more laid back and not so emotionally heated about the stuff, but armchair philosophies waste a bunch of time. They waste a bunch of airspace and a bunch of people talking and just, it's in my mind, things that waste time in that way our time that we could be spending engaging in pleasurable activities, basically. That's why I dislike them. So her comment is specifically in reference to um, a question I'd asked her before this regarding a previous comment she made where she mentioned um, in a joke, obviously, that, you know, for once I'm saying something truthful. Obviously, that was an exaggeration and a joke. I understand that. Um, but basically even jokes, they contain information that's useful and important to take note of. So in other words, what she was referring to, obviously, in her clarification was the fact that, um, mainly my critiques of Ethelism and my quote unquote belief in Gnosticism, uh, which is not a belief by the way, but I will clarify that later in this video. And so those are the two main things. So before that, I obviously made clear that, well, what about all the other other content I talk about on this channel? So that kind of a joke, it, it sort of makes it out to be that those are like the only two things I discuss, when in fact, that's very far from the truth. I talk about all sorts of other topics, and I just tend to have those particular two views on those specific things. And yes, I do talk about those things often in terms of my personal view and stance on antinatalism and what we practically do with that. But I do talk about a lot of other topics themselves. So I do understand that stuff like that is a joke when people say it, you know, the first time I'm being truthful, but um, you see what I'm saying here. It's, it, it's those kinds of jokes are often semi-serious. They're reflecting an emotionality or a response to my overall take on most things or rather my personal take on topics that I bring up, in other words. So let's first address the first point, 
my critiques of Ethelism. And everyone listening and watching, please leave your comments below. Let me know what you think in terms of, is this critique itself in any way dishonest, first of all? And of course, her reference to dishonesty was the fact that she personally thinks that hedonism and antinatalism being practiced together is a contradictory thing and contradictory things are dishonest. Um, and we'll address that in a second. But first of all, let's discuss my critiques of Ephelism and whether those critiques themselves are dishonest, okay? Or whether they are honest critiques that are reasonable and worth actually taking note of, okay? So my main critiques of Ephelism are, number one, the fact that in the practical sense, practically everybody in the world who is an Ephelist currently, they're not able to practically actually do anything with the Ephelist viewpoint. It's literally just nothing more than, I believe, I think that reality, or this particular reality, would be better off without any sentient forms anywhere under all circumstances. That's Ephelism. Because antinatalism by itself already accounts for individually abstaining from and actively doing what you can to prevent more forms from being forced here into sentience against their will, actively. So antinatalism by itself already covers that base without Ephelism needed. Ephelism, however, is the stance that life itself, life entirely, thus why it's called Ephelism, anti-life, the opposite of life, is worth preventing in every circumstance everywhere across the universe and specifically in the more practical sense in every single case on this earth preventing all new life from arising here right or all new life that is in the even more practical sense capable of feeling pain or torment to any capacity right so every antinatalist agrees that actively that's what we're already doing anyway right the issue with Ephelism is that it's this unnecessary additional narrative that's not doable in a practical sense. And the bigger problem with it, so the second critique I have of it, is if and when the Ephelist activities or the Ephelist idea is able to be put into application, the only ways it can be done are via force on a mass scale, either with a massive, huge nuclear weapon, okay, that somehow is able to destroy the entire planet or kill all life on it, like instantly, or some or some Death Star grade weapon, or like some uh, you know just hyper powered weapon that's somehow able to vaporize the entire planet, all life on it, just instantly, where no pain is felt by any forms or anything like this. But realistically, in the more realistic world, a scenario that would be far more likely to happen is a nuclear bomb exploding and destroying the entire world. And in fact, it wouldn't instantly destroy a life. Life would experience, at least in certain regions of the world, would experience an agonizing death of radiation and just burning and roasting before death. Um, but that's the other problem. Or a case of mass sterilization of having to literally sterilize every single species on the planet, because just sterilizing humans wouldn't solve anything, really, according to the Ephelist view, because their goal is to sterilize to prevent every form from emerging in this world. So, whereas the antinatalist view is very practical in the sense that the goal is to ensure that whatever life is here experiences maximal pleasure and minimal agony and torment, we're not opposed to life in and of itself existing. We're just opposed to pain and torment being inflicted onto life. Okay. And we're aware that there's other possible worlds and other possible situations, potentially in the future, or other variations of reality where life can exist in a state of perpetual pleasure, or at least where the baseline state is a neutral state and not a state of agony or torment. You know, we understand that this is a possibility for sentient experience to be this type of a thing going on. So we understand there's no necessity for Ephelism, and we also at the same time if we think deep enough about it, see that Ephelism has these core problems to it, okay? That it's either just an armchair musing, thus useless and pointless, and a waste of airspace and thought space. And number two, uh, if it's not that, if it's acted on, 
the only implications of that would be some horrific mass scale act of like a supervillain level, right? And who with the Evilist would say, oh, this is ultimately a good thing. But if you have to add ultimate before good, it's not actually a good thing, right? Or this would ultimately be the least bad thing, etc. However they view it, right? Even if they acknowledge it's evil. Any way you cut the coin on that, whether it's mass sterilization of every single species that exists somehow, which would only be achievable, by the way, with future technology. There's no way to do that otherwise. Or a Death Star grade weapon that vaporizes everything. That's a, that either one of those are a really horrifying prospect because the only being who would be willing to do either thing would be an entity that's like a supervillain level person. Like, that's it. And what do supervillains do? They justify and believe what they're doing is the less bad thing, right? Or is a good thing. That's how supervillains think. That's exactly how they think. So if a person cannot see the problems with evilism on either side of this, the armchair philosophy problem or the practical activity being a horrific supervillain issue problem, then I don't know how to make it any more clear to people. Okay. So for both of these reasons, the armchair philosophy problem and the supervillain issue, these are the reasons why I dislike evilism. And it should be quite obvious to every antinatalist um, why I dislike it. Like, you know, I don't dislike the individual people themselves who hold the idea. And I apologize if it seems like that, if I've been overly aggressive to the point that it seems like I despise the people themselves. No, I don't. I just think their engagement in that idea, thinking it's a good idea or a less bad idea is just, I think it's really warped thinking, right? Um, and I really do honestly feel that way. I just think it's not, number one, I, I think it, at the very least, it's just not being thought about to enough of a deep degree, or it's just not being treated as seriously as it should be getting treated. And it's only being treated as an armchair thing, which is also a problem. Okay. In and of itself. Yeah. It's a, it's a less of a problem if it's just treated as an armchair thing, but it's still a problem. It's, it's just wasted brain space and airspace at that point. And there's nothing inherently like horrific about wasted brain and airspace. People do it all the time, but I, I just, I, I'm not a fan of things that waste air or mind space. That's, that's all. So I'm a fan of things that are tangible and practical, right? That are doable because especially I don't personally feel this way, but if, if you're a person who believes this is the only single sentient life there is of you and that you don't continue on past this body or whatever, then especially so you should be spending every moment, every waking hour getting as much pleasure as you possibly can and spreading as much pleasure as you can continually while you're here, especially if you think this is the only life there is for crying out loud, you know? So, um, but you should do that anyway, whether you think this life continues on afterwards or not, because why waste time doing stuff that's miserable or being in a state that's other than pleasure? It just doesn't make any rational sense. And that brings me to my next point. So I hope that covered the ephilism point. And please comment below. Let me know whether you think what I've just said is truthful, honest, rational, reasonable, and has covered the two issues of armchair philosophy problem and supervillain Death Star mass sterilization problem of ethelism. And if you think either of those things are completely unreasonable, then please let me know and tell me why you think those things are unreasonable and tell me why you think those things are dishonest. If you think they're dishonest somehow, or if you think they are honest, let me know that as well. Just let me know what you think. I'd like to see what you have to say, whether you're an ethelist or not. So point two, that she brought up was my so-called belief in Gnosticism, quote unquote, belief in Gnosticism. I can't really emphasize this enough. When I say Gnosticism, I'm literally referring to the activity of knowing what we do know for sure. So you, me, all of us, what is scientifically verified to be, to be known so far and focusing my focus and emphasis on formulating hypotheses regarding what could in fact actually be going on beyond what we know as my emphasis. But all of the things that I believe are likely true or may be true are hypotheses. And I'm aware they're hypotheses. So I don't believe those things. I feel that, okay, 
this is likely the case, and these are my experiences. Therefore, I'm going to go on this hunch, experience, gut feeling until new evidence arises to where I will accordingly adjust my view and refine my view. Okay? So it's not a belief in the sense of a religion. You can be an ethelist and a Gnostic at the same time, by the way. I don't know if I've made that clear enough in previous videos, but that is the case. So there's literally no correlation between my criticism of ethelism and Gnosticism itself. For example, the channel Mark Antinatalist, he has a far more accommodative, um, laid back, accepting view of ethelist views than I do. And he's reflected that in his videos, at least um, from what I've seen so far. He's a channel I like. He's a person I like personally beyond his content and channel. A cool dude. Um, and he is, in fact, the inspiration for me creating this channel, one of my main inspirations. And I really enjoyed his format. So I was like, you know what? I want to do something similar to this and express my thoughts on this topic as well. So shout out to you, Mark Antinatalist. And um, please check out his channel. If you're an Ephelist, you'll probably um, be able to relate to him more than you will me honestly, and I'm just saying that truthfully, if you hold Ephelous views. So Mark Antinatalist, check him out. He's got good stuff. But my point is he holds views that could be classified as Gnostic views, or rather he appreciates Gnostic views on things. And he makes that very clear in his content. Um, but he also is more... Um, He's more attuned, I guess you could say, to Ephelist stances or perspectives than I am. I, I very much so, I think, relate less to Ephelist views than he does in the sense that um, I'm sure he's aware of what I'm talking about in this video and the points I'm making, but that's my point. It's like he's an example of someone who is Gnostic in perspective, but at the same time, he, he also is more... Um, I guess you could say appreciative of Ephelist's views also, you know, we, I appreciate people themselves individually, whatever their views are. Okay. So if you're a commenter, if you watch my stuff, I appreciate you directly. Okay. Whether you're an Ephelist or not. But, um, I would say in terms of viewpoint, as of this video, Mark has shown to be a person who tends to appreciate whether he agrees with them or not. He tends to appreciate Ephelist views themselves more than I do. And you've probably seen that, right? So, and that's okay, you know, to each their own, but I'm, I'm using his channel as an example of you can do Gnosticism and Ephelism at the same time. So there's, I don't want people to wrongly think that there's this automatic, um, separation between Gnosticism and Ephelism. No, they're, they're distinct things and they can potentially overlap. So you can be an atheist Gnostic very much so. And I think what people are not understanding a lot is that Nag Hammadi Gnosticism, so historical, traditional Gnosticism as practiced in the past, there were also a variety of different Gnostic views in the past as well. Some of them religious, some of them not religious. But I think people are only familiar with the religious versions of Gnosticism. And therefore, when you say Gnostic, they automatically think religious Gnostic. But that's actually not the case. So you can see this on Mark's channel and my channel. Neither of us are religious. We're both non-religious, but we are Gnostic in perspective, even though we're not religious about it. Okay. So, um, our views are very, very similar on a lot of things and most things. Um, but there are some differences that, but the, the differences are comparatively minor, right? But Gnosticism is simply baseline Gnosticism means it's basically the same thing as agnosticism, but the emphasis is different. You could say that. Okay. The emphasis in Gnosticism is basing things on what you do know for sure and formulating hypotheses as to what is likely the case and likely true as your focus. Okay. But depending on the particular individual, you could be a Gnostic theist. You could be an atheistic inclined Gnostic. You, it, it varies. You could be a religious Gnostic. You could be a non-religious Gnostic. You could be a theistic Gnostic, a non-theistic Gnostic. You could be some hybrid. You could be a misotheist. So Mark also mentions that he's a misotheist, which means you believe in the existence of theistic entities, but you're 
in opposition to them and what they're doing. So it's like, instead of just not believing they exist or not thinking they exist, it's like there's a hunch that, okay, they probably do exist, but I oppose them, right? That's misotheism. So it's, it's, uh, it's also a variation of Gnosticism. So there's all sorts of different variations of Gnosticism and what it means. It's not just, and it is not people just using the term and throwing it around and using it for whatever. Gnosticism factually is a very fluent term that can refer to a huge wide range of views. And I really want people to understand this, okay? Gnosticism is not this little boxed in, okay, Nag, the Nag Hammadi library, the Dead Sea Scrolls and all that other type of stuff. Yes, that is one branch or aspect of Gnosticism. That is. But that's not that's not what Gnosticism itself is, okay? It's just like the misnomer of um, thinking basically a, a, like a baseline overall stance on something is automatically these other things. It, it is not that the case. So when someone says my belief in Gnosticism, I think a lot of times they're assuming wrongly that I'm, I believe the Nag Hammadi texts literally, and I have a religious Gnostic view. That's not actually the case. When I say Gnosticism personally, I mean my focus and emphasis is on what I do know in formulating hypothesis about what is likely true. And I personally individually happen to have a theistic stance on things um, versus a non-theistic stance. Hypothesis. I have a theistic hypothesis, okay? Versus a non-theistic hypothesis. That's all. But that's just me individually. It, it doesn't mean every Gnostic is a theist or has a theistic stance on things. The Gnostic, and the reason that term is used is someone is aware and picks up on the fact that, okay, this particular reality is full of torment and torture, which is evil. Okay, but if that which is imposed on you against your will is something that's evil. That's recognized clearly by the Gnostic. The Gnostic is seeing that, okay, that is clearly, you could almost say objectively, evil. It's not just happening, just going on. It's actually an evil thing. Okay, it's actually horrible. It's actually terrible. Like it's it's factually diabolically evil. That's the Gnostic view. Beyond that, Gnostics vary in all sorts of ways. The Gnostic view seeing, okay, that's evil, their view on what is in fact actually good, or whether there is good that exists, or what the world is beyond this one, or what should be done beyond that varies drastically. Okay? Drastically, Gnostics have very different views on all sorts of things, okay? So it's not this boxed-in, cookie-cutter-like thing. It's just it's just referring to the person's overall perspective and stance on reality itself. That's all Gnosticism means when somebody says a Gnostic, okay? And yeah, there's very common threads within Gnostic thought. So there's the common thread of recognition of the Demiurge or Archons and things like this amongst theistic Gnostics, or at least, or misotheistic Gnostics. Um, and you know, I personally am not a misotheist per se. I'm a misotheist towards certain types of entities. Yes. Like evil demonic entities and stuff, but I'm not necessarily opposed to every single theistic entity. That's like, you know, of cosmic degrees of influence or whatever. And really the, the Gnostic premise, um, most commonly holds that there's a sentient there's a sentience behind this cosmos and the re this reality we're experiencing. Whether they think that sentience is actively malevolent or just an indifferent sentience that exists but has nothing to do with us or doesn't care about us at all, that view also varies. It, it just, you know. Um, so I really hope that makes sense and clarifies things. And the point I was actually um, going to cover before this, but I'll cover now, the third point regarding the view that what she thought was dishonest, right? The view that antinatalism and hedonism are a contradiction. Number one, if you could explain to me, why do you think that is a contradiction? First off. Uh, and number two, the clarification that I don't just talk about hedonism by itself. I specify benevolent hedonism. There's a difference between hedonism in general and benevolent hedonism. They're not the same thing. Other than, obviously, they're both hedonistic, one is very different from the other, okay? So, number one, first of all, if you're an antinatalist or an ephilist or anybody existing in this world, but especially 
if you're somebody who thinks this is the only life there is, which I do not hold that view as of this video, but if you're, especially if you're that type of person though, why would you engage in anything other than benevolent hedonism as your focus daily in everything you do? Because why wouldn't you specifically focus on maximizing your pleasure and others' pleasure and engaging in as much sexual pleasure and other pleasures as you possibly can, whether genital contact in nature or not, why wouldn't you have that as your daily focus all the time anyway, right? So I think they're referring to the fact that there's a slight possibility or a slight risk if you're irresponsible with it of accidentally ejaculating into the vagina of a female and impregnating her if you don't have a vasectomy. I think that's what they're referring to when they say contradictory. But number one, first of all, you could engage in benevolent hedonism and never physically have sex with a woman, especially nowadays. You could just have your entire life pornography, masturbating to that, no risk, no possibility of producing children that way. That's also benevolent hedonism. As well as you could make love to love dolls, sex dolls, use sex toys and all this other type of stuff. Also, once again, no risk or possibility of producing children or bringing them here. As well as if somebody does the birth control thing or the vasectomy thing, same thing. So, but even if you don't get a vasectomy and even if you do have physical intercourse, if you're very responsible with what you're doing, once again, that's the benevolent part. That's within the fold of benevolence. You're calculating the pleasure of others and you're being responsible with your pleasure. So you're not having sex when you're drunk. You're not doing something that could possibly lead you into a state where you're not cognizant of what you're doing. Um, you're using a condom if you ever do vaginal penetration and things like this. So personally, in my situation, I prefer to give women anal sex anyway. It feels much better. And I... I could actually go my whole life without ever giving a female vaginal sex, but females like vaginal a lot and they enjoy it. And I'm okay giving them that. I I feel that feels great also, but it's not like something I personally have to do. Like it's, you know what I'm saying? I I'm totally um, great. Just giving women anal only if they were into that. Right. But you know, even when I do that, obviously I make sure she either isn't able to have kids at all in the first place it already. And so the woman, one of the main women I'm with right now, she's incapable of having children anyway. So that's not even an issue. There's not even a possibility of that. So no risk there. Uh, the other one I'm with has a specific insert that prevents that or that drastically reduces the likelihood of that to where it's like, you know, less than 0.1% possibility, like to where it's like, basically entirely impossible. Okay. And obviously on top of that, I'm also responsible with that, with ejaculation and when I do that and all that type of stuff. So, um, but even if that wasn't the case, then you could, you still have all sorts of other means to be benevolently hedonistic without directly physically having intercourse. So, so it doesn't really make any rational sense saying that benevolent hedonism is contradictory because like, what else are you going to do unless you're engaging in benevolent hedonism? Are you just going to sit and pout all day about how bad the world is and just be a depressed sourpuss all the time and just like never or barely ever engage in romance with anybody or what? I mean, never masturbate, never focus on getting as much pleasure as you can from masturbation. Like what are you doing other than benevolent hedonism anyway, as an antinatalist that that's what doesn't make sense to me, you know? So it's like, you know, if you are an antinatalist or an ethalist, you're obviously not bringing more forms into this world or imposing that on them. You're sure as hell not intentionally doing so. Okay. And, uh, so what else are you doing other than benevolent hedonism? And so when people say maximizing others, pleasure, minimizing their pain and getting, focusing on your copes or whatever, focusing on your pleasure as much, they're talking about benevolent hedonism. That's, that is what they're discussing. They're just not calling it that. Okay. So it's the same thing. So that's what I don't understand. Like focusing on your hobbies, what you enjoy, that's part of hedonism. That's enjoyable stuff. Okay. When, when I talk about benevolent hedonism, I'm not only talking about having physical sex with other people. 
And even in that, I regulate myself as well. So it's, it's not just randomly having sex with whoever, just right, left, and center as much as you can. It's not hookup culture. It's not uh, – I mean, if that's your thing and you're doing that, that's an individual choice. But that's not what I'm talking about when I say benevolent hedonism. I'm not referring to those things. I'm talking about responsible engagement in sexual things. Aware, vividly, where you're never drunk, you're always sober, you know what you're doing. You're not doing drugs or all this type of stuff. The benevolent part, the perpetual pleasure part, is where you're engaging in pleasures that ensure you keep feeling pleasure after the fact. So you're not experiencing hangovers. You're not experiencing crashes after overindulgence and too much dopamine surging and all this stuff. No, you're perpetuating your pleasure sexually and otherwise. You're ensuring it continues. You're not just foolishly, irresponsibly doing anything. You know, so it's not like you're not sniffing cocaine. You're not doing anything because none of those things are responsible Thus, they're not benevolent. If something's irresponsible, it's not benevolent, okay? So benevolent and responsible are together. They're correlated. They're like the same thing, all right? Irresponsibility is clearly not benevolent, right? So I think when I say benevolent hedonism, if people haven't really paid attention to what I'm saying, they're assuming, oh, random sex orgies where you're just penetrating vaginas right, left, and center. You're getting drunk. You're getting high, and you're just inserting your penis randomly into people, you know, who you just barely met and then you're ejaculating here and there and you're risking STDs and risking getting people pregnant. Like that's not even remotely what I do in my life. And that's not even what I'm talking about when I say benevolent hedonism. That would be hedonism that is not benevolent. That would be hedonism by itself. Okay. That would be contradictory, but that's not what I'm referring to. <laughs> okay. So let me just clarify that very clearly here. That That's not what I'm talking about whenever I'm talking about perpetual pleasurism or romance or sexual focus I am not referring to that loose, random sex with people you've just barely met, drugs, uh, alcohol, hangover. I'm not referring to any of that shit at all. OK, I'm referring to very responsible sexual engagement, knowing who you're with, making sure to take precautions, making sure to ensure that you don't impregnate people. That's what I'm referring to. OK, if you even do that, I mean, if you just masturbate and do the sex doll thing and stuff, that's also benevolent hedonism and it's far less risky also. You're not risking STDs and everything else. That's also doable. And um, that's a huge amount of how I do it, actually, because I, I really don't feel all that much of a requirement to have to have sex with a huge number of people or anything like that. I just, you know, yeah, I have intercourse with specific people, but it's, you know, so I, I think what I'm saying is making sense now to people. If, if you haven't understood it by now, um, what I'm actually getting at with this. So. That being understood and clarified, what about any of that is contradictory or dishonest or untruthful? In fact, every Ephelist or antenatalist is already engaging in benevolent hedonism. That's what they're talking about discussing. That's what they're emphasizing, whether they use that word or not. And so if somebody is not admitting that that's what they're doing or talking about or emphasizing, that's being dishonest. So an antenatalist or an Ephelist saying, emphasizing, focusing on your hobbies, pleasure, and having a good time in life and all this type of stuff, and then not acknowledging that that's benevolent hedonism, that's being dishonest because that is what that is. That is hedonism. It's benevolent hedonism, okay? It's not something else. So if we're going to be talking dishonesty, it would be dishonest for an antinatalist to say there's something other than a benevolent hedonist in activity, in practical action, right? And this is why I say antenatalism, along with benevolent hedonism, is what we're all practically doing already. I just emphasize it that we should have our philosophy be the same thing that we're actually actively doing. Why have a philosophy that's separate from what you're actively doing? It doesn't make any sense. So how is any of this that I'm saying dishonest in any way whatsoever? You know, I feel like I've been more honest than just about anybody on my channel about what I think and feel about stuff, how I'm going about life, how I'm doing things and stuff. And really, to be honest with you, <laughs> pun very much intended. <laughs> I feel like the majority of Ephelists who hear my stuff when they, when they see me speaking against those two issues with Ephelism, the armchair philosophy problem, um, which is the more minor issue. It's not that big of an issue. If it, honestly, if, if Ephelism was just only an armchair philosophy problem issue, by its, that's all it was, I actually wouldn't have that much of an issue with it. I'd just be like, yeah, it's just a waste of time. But I wouldn't like be so emotionally heated about it. Like, 
I, I get emotionally heated about it because I, I know the implications of what that would mean if an ethylist or a large number of ethylists got a hold of or were near a nuclear weapon that was really, really fucking powerful or got a hold of or were near the ability to mass sterilize a large number of different species, humans and others included. I, I'm aware of the dangerous fucking implications of what that would mean. And yes, natalists, that's why we're antinatalists and ethylists. So that's, they're not the topic of this video. All of us are aware of the horrors and the people, cause people always bring up, what about, you know, uh, what about natalists? They're also engaging in horrors. It's, it's just as horrible. Yes, it is. It is horrible that natalists are near nukes and continuing to produce children. All that. Nobody's denying that at all. Okay. But at least natalists, they have some wherewithal to not blow huge amounts of beings up and mass sterilize by force, huge numbers of species. And that's what I'm saying. If you're not, if you're not just an armchair ethylist, if you got in a position of power with a bunch of other ethylists somehow and had access to these things, either you're going to remain an armchair person and not do anything with your philosophy and be a hypocrite, or you're going to act on it. And that's fucking dangerous. And that's the problem I'm noticing. So <laughs> I think ethylists are also seeing that there is a problem there, but they're not willing to admit that there is a problem with it in both the armchair philosophy sense and in the practical horror implication sense of what it would mean if they got access to these abilities or these things, right? They're recognizing that I'm calling out a bad idea and they're uncomfortable with the fact that I'm calling out a bad idea that they would prefer to feel like is a good idea. They would prefer to feel like it's a less bad idea. They would prefer to, to be in an emotional comfort zone where somebody isn't speaking against the thing that is quite obvious to them is a miss in these two notable ways. Okay. And I think that's what it is. I think Ephelis actually are aware of exactly what I'm talking about. And they're just not willing to actually admit this. And I think that's actually why uh, there tends to be a disturbance towards my critique of Ephelism, which is completely valid, by the way. Like, if, if it hasn't become very clear to people why this critique of Ephelism is valid by now, by the end of this video, I don't know what more I, I can say about it, honestly, you know? <clears throat> and also, I hope this video has validated the validity, the 100% validity of antinatalism being practiced as a benevolent hedonist, along with benevolent hedonism, as the only truthful, honest thing to do, in fact. The only fully honest, truthful thing to do. Period. Right? Or at least the most honest, truthful thing to do, rather. So, let me know what you think below. And please tell me. Please elaborate on these points. So, you know, like what, what could be more honest than being an antinatalist and a benevolent hedonist at the same time? What could be more honest than that? Let me know, please. Is there something other than that that's more honest? That's not contradictory? You know? I mean, if literally all you're talking about is just you should abstain from physical intercourse with other human beings, I mean, okay, that's doable. It's not that hard to do. If you're, if you're talking about just the fact that I'm having any physical intercourse with others and not specifically having a vasectomy myself as being the contradiction. Well, that's pretty ridiculous because let me just clarify that in this and I'll do an entire video on this. The reason I don't feel comfortable getting a vasectomy is many fold. Uh, number one, I don't trust the thing because my physiology is massively affected adversely by anything I alter or just, I've been accidentally chemically castrated by saw palmetto ingesting it. So that was nightmarish. And so that's why I don't trust anything like that going into my system whether it's a jab or whether it's um, vasectomy or whatever, a genital messing, I don't go there. Okay. I don't trust this shit. You know, so the way my physiology works, it's highly likely it would, my body would respond different than most people's bodies respond to that shit. I don't trust it at all. Okay. Uh, I don't feel comfortable having blades or twisting or anything going on down there with my genitals. I just, it makes me fucking squeam just thinking about it. Okay. If you want to do it and do it, that's your thing. It's you do you, okay? I'm not saying what people should or shouldn't do. I'm just saying for me personally, I have very valid reasons not to get it done, okay? 
Um, but I'm extremely responsible. So it's like, yeah, obviously there's no way to 100% like to the nth power ensure that I don't accidentally impregnate a chick like a, a completely 100%. But there's like 99.99% ability of me to not do that the way I go about things, right? And that's re that's really all you can do unless you get a vasectomy, obviously, you know, unless the woman you're with has something going on where it's a hundred percent assured she's not going to get impregnated or whatever. I, you know, you do what you can do. I mean, like, it's just, you have to be reasonable with these things. You can't just, um, you know, not all of us feel comfortable getting vasectomies. Not all of us are cool with that. And am I capable of abstaining from physical intercourse with women? Sure I am, but I have a female who isn't able to get impregnated anyway, who enlists. So that would be pointless. I enjoy giving women anal more anyway. And I can easily just do that only exclusively. I have no issues with that. Really, it's the only reason I give women vaginal is because they specifically like vaginal and enjoy it. And so when I do it, I make sure I'm especially responsible and careful when I do that. So, you know, and if it came down to the fact that, okay, somehow, in spite of all of this, a child popped up and was brought into existence. I mean, it's like, okay, I would just be like, okay, I literally did everything I could. I made every reasonable uh, precaution I could. I practically did everything I practically could. And okay, yes, it is on me. I had the kid. There it is. I'll, you know, take care of it financially for life. Make sure it has the best life possible. I would tell it. I'd be like, yeah, you yourself are not a mistake. Your existence isn't a mistake. Me f accidentally imposing life on you into this particular world is on me. That is the mistake. Your life itself isn't a mistake. You should be perpetually pleasured in a sentient state outside of this one. And I would tell the kid that that is on me. And I would make sure to give them as, as good a life as possible. Okay. But that's what I'm saying. You just, you have to be reasonable with these things. And I, you know, even if that did happen, no, I'm not just going to fucking guilt trip myself and be like, Oh, I'm the worst being that's ever existed. It, it, that, that's just ridiculous. You know, something over the top like that, you know? So, I mean, if somebody thinks it's dishonest to have any degree of like sexual activity whatsoever like that, then that's just pretty over the top to be fully honest with you, you know, and the fact that it's totally doable to not actually do that anyway in the first place uh, is the other factor, right? So is it like microscopically slightly less responsible than getting a vasectomy? Sure. I, I would be willing to admit that, but it's not like vastly crazily more irresponsible. It's not like irresponsible to the degree of any noteworthiness really or irresponsible to the degree of like, you know, Oh, you're a horrible diabolical person for not getting a vasectomy or some shit like that. No, of course not. You know what I mean? So anyway, I hope this clarifies this topic completely. And, um, if you want to email me or talk to me directly about this topic, feel free to email me Gnostic at gmail.com. I'd be happy to talk with you and please be sure to like, share and subscribe and spread the word if you found this message of inspiration and usefulness. And I will talk to you soon. Happy pleasuring. Talk to you later.